So Einstein's, Einstein's explanation of this, which I'll post his, um, his paper on this. Uh, it's, it's definitely worth, you know, seeing at some point in your life. Um, by the way, I'm seeing with the sunset here, I can just see out the reflection that it looks like we have some nice sun dogs tonight. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but when the atmosphere gets cold enough, um, uh, uh, very strict crystalline ice crystals uh, form in the upper atmosphere, and it reflects light at something like an angle of like 27 degrees. So you actually see like just as the sun sets and when the atmosphere kind of like amplifies some of those red wavelengths, it tends to bend and you see two other like images of the sun on like on either side at that like 27 degree angle, I think is what it was. So it, it makes almost like a 45 degree light cone where you see almost three equivalent suns. So I think that is happening right now. Kind of cool. Anyway. Um, by the way, there's not much left here. This is just, this is what we're going to do and then we'll wrap it up. So um, let's talk about exactly what assumptions he made. And first of all, I think this one is the one that we should start with. So let's call this A, B, C, <laughs> C, and D. Uh, I could have done that a lot better. Anyway, not my best effort. Um, anyway, based on C, which just to be clear, frequency versus energy. This is the using proper units. If we measure the energy in EVs, where if you recall, one EV equals 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that's, it, it's a tiny amount of energy, but it describes the amount of energy that basically that, that is on the electron scale. <laughs> so there is a good reason why it's called electron volts. And, and specifically it describes how much energy an electron gains if it goes across a one volt potential difference. Again, it's based on this equation. Uh, Q, sorry, delta E, the amount of energy gained or lost by an electron, e equals Q delta V. And one electron volt, sorry, one electron times one volt is literally one electron volt of energy. So again, we're measuring the energy in electron volts. And um, in this axis here, that's electron volts. Here for the, um, sorry, here for the frequency, measure frequency in hertz, which is inverse seconds. Um, yeah. And by the way, as, as the, the frequency in hertz increases, um, the wavelength decreases. So if those two things are correct, the graph that you end up with here looks like this. Here we have the energy. Here we have sorry, the energy in EVs. Here we have um, the frequency in one over seconds. So the slope that we actually measure here, the slope m, has a value, first of all, of, and I want to be entirely, 6 point, yeah, uh, 6.626. I can get it to usually two, uh, uh, three six things. So 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Now in this case here, this is in units of joules of joule seconds. And so I'm going to convert that to 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15. And by the way, um, so yeah, just ignore that. Um, the units are going to be EV divided by inverse seconds or hertz. So again, it's the units of whatever Y is divided by the units of X. So really the same thing as EV times seconds. And that's exactly what our units here are, EV seconds. And that's precisely the slope that you would measure if you do this and you use the proper units, which just, we've just recorded here. So that's the precise amount of, uh, of energy per amount of, of, of frequency here, basically. So that's, I think, step A, um, that 
there is some like actual measurable energy there. And specifically, if we focus on this part of the graph, we can say that the energy now is directly proportional to the frequency. Or specifically, what Einstein interpreted was that aside from the question of why doesn't it start at zero, so, so we'll come back to that in a second, but he said that as we go forward in frequency, it looks like the energy is a direct linear, um, uh, it's directly linear related. Now, ideally, it should go through the origin. So, like, zero is corresponds to zero. But if, if we pretend it's, it's perfectly proportional, that each step along the axis here is always going to have the same amount of rise. Um, and so we should, we end up finding that the energy that's involved, E, is proportional to frequency, meaning that somehow or another, as light comes forward, as light's carrying, you know, its own energy, that the energy we can calculate per tiny amount of, of, of light, because we're talking about the amount of energy given to an electron. If light somehow interacts with electrons and it gives them energy, that energy seems to be related to its frequency. So in other words, based on this, the energy of light that it can give to an electron is directly related to its frequency. And actually, you know, let me take a step back. Um, the biggest takeaway uh, not takeaway in the British sense we're not doing takeout food. Um, the biggest takeaway here, um, his biggest kind of explanation was uh, threefold. Number one, when light comes this way, based on everything he could observe, if we have the certain combination of things, and if, if, if it is the type of light that will produce a current, that light comes in and it is fully absorbed by an electron. That's his step one. Step two, if that energy that was absorbed by the electron was enough to free it from its atom or its nucleus. In other words, if whatever that wavelength that we now have had, a, had a, uh, uh, at least enough critical energy in order to transfer it to the electron it will escape its nucleus. So there is a threshold amount of energy an electron needs to gain in order to jump ship and start flowing across that gap. So by varying the frequency, we can in fact give more and more energy to electrons and cause them to actually overcome that attraction they have to the nucleus. And then number three, this is the big one. Um, and so I'll write all this up in a second. Um, but that last graph that, was, that we saw, the weirdest one, I think, with that, that straight energy graph, no matter how low or high the energy, that we get the same, sorry, no matter lo how low or high the intensity, we get the same energy. This is maybe the biggest key here, because what he realized is that this is happening on a one-to-one -one scale, that electrons are individual units. The only way that every single electron can get the same amount of energy from that light is that if every electron absorbs exactly the, the same packet of light, or sorry, packet of energy. I, I really screwed that up there because this is kind of a big crescendo. Like the fact that if there's an electron here and all those electrons end up flowing through the wire with the same energy, that means they have all received exactly the same amount of energy from the light that hit it. And really the only way that's possible is if light is broken up into little tiny chunks each of them with that exact amount of energy. Or, or at least maybe a, a scaled multiple of it. So isn't that kind of cool though? Based on that intensity versus time graph that I just raised, aren't it? That, that was his biggest contribution. That light operates according to individual amounts of energy. And each little tiny bit of energy is transferred by a single packet of light, if you will. And that, that you can change the amount of energy of each packet by changing the frequency. And you can change the amount of current going through the wire by simply just adding more and more of those packets of energy to the beam. And that's exactly what he realized at ramping up the intensity of that beam is. That by changing the intensity of the beam, he's simply just adding more and more of those packets of energy. And at some point, it's, I mean, it's literally just a multiple, you know, a, a scaled multiple. The more of these packets of energy, 
the more current we get in a, in a linear, linear fashion. So that's the result. Light is quantized. And that I, I can't understate how important that is. Light, which we had always viewed to be continuous waves or beams of energy, is now coming in terms of little tiny chunks and not continuous streams. And this is anything, more than anything else, this is the fundamental essence of quantum physics. That things that mathematically behave according to continuous functions are in fact quantized units and should not behave those mathematical properties. But they do. We're going to see a lot more of this. So, the biggest takeaway. Number one, um, light, and I'm doing these in the reverse order of what I just said. Light comes in individual packets. of energy called photons. And this is the first time I've used that term where I feel like you fully understand where that came from. Number two, each photon carries exactly this much energy. Where those two values that I just quoted, if you, if you use that first one, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, that will give you the answer in joules. In this case here, if you're using electron volts, you multiply that by the frequency of a photon. That gives you the energy in electron volts. So anyway, that's his explanation for, for, why, for exactly how much energy a photon must have. Now, number three. Um, by um, every metal has a distinct amount of essentially like attractive force that holds the electrons to each uh, proton in the nucleus. And for each individual met uh, metal, there is amount of, of energy required to release that electron from its electrical attraction. And we call this now the work function, W. And it's, it's going to be typically on the order of electron volts. And it's basically saying how much energy is required to pull an electron from what we now call the ground state out to ionization. And the easiest way to describe this really, it's a work function or a binding energy of the electron. So it's the, the amount of energy that each electron, in, at least in its lowest level, has to overcome to leave that atom. And by the way, that's the, that's the reason why there's a critical frequency. That below that frequency, each photon simply doesn't have enough energy to release that electron. So what happens is you might heat that electron up, or it might simply be reflected, but it won't be uh, absorbed, um, or at least it won't release the electrons if it is absorbed, I should say. Um, and then finally, the last result here that I will add. So if it's not clear, um, the number of photons released is not related to the energy of the photons. If you increase the energy, uh, that's not number three, this is number four. If increase E, the energy of the photons, you do not increase the current. So by the way, this is kind of as the reasoning. So since, since this is true, this is what one of those other graphs, um, uh, the graph of constant, yeah, of, of constant uh, current. Um, so if that's true, then what that means is that Every photon has to interact with only one electron. That let's say that photon has three times three times the amount of work uh, function or three times the amount of binding energy. That photon can't distribute that 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 extra energy to two other extra electrons. That photon can either give that electron all of the energy or none of it. And specifically, if the photon just has too much energy, all that happens is the electron is released with more energy too. So 
This is the explanation here. Each photon only interacts with one electron, giving it either all or none of its energy. So this one is, again, this is, these two things are uniquely quantum in nature. That you can't predict either of those to be true. You know, if you had a big three-ton ball landing on me and two friends, we, all, we would all three absorb the energy. But quantum, quantum mechanically says only I can absorb the energy. Now, finally, the last thing here, um, increasing the intensity of the light simply just increases the number of photons. The intensity equals number of photons. So by providing more, a uh, higher number of photons we, uh, per second, we release more electrons per second. So that, I hope that makes sense there. So this is what we collectively call the photoelectric effect. And let me change the very top of this. Then. So this is really what the explanation of the photoelectric effect is. And then we'll see why really each of these terms is meaningful in itself as we go along. Um, so uh, that's all I have here. Um, this is uh, quite a bit, but I hope it makes sense.